Hello, everyone. Welcome to SAG After Foundation's Conversations at Home. My name is Brianna Rodriguez. I'm the editor in chief at Backstage, and I'm so excited uh, to be sitting down to chat with actor and star of Penny Dreadful City of Angels, Natalie Dormer. Hello. Hi, Brianna. How are you? I'm doing well, you know, keeping on the way we can in these crazy times. <laughs> keeping on, keeping on. I feel you. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I would love to start with, uh, speaking of the times, uh, you know, how have you been keeping sane during quarantine? Do you have routines set up? Or are you like, what, how is it working for you these days? Uh, yeah, I mean, like you guys, our restrictions were very strict for a very long time. So they've only sort of been lifted in the last few weeks that we can move around more freely. And I mean, I came back from finishing shooting Penny Dreadful City of Angels only about a week before we had lockdown. So after an eight month shoot, I was ready to collapse anyway. <laughs> so um, I took advantage of lockdown for the first month and caught up on my sleep. Um, and then I'm very lucky. Um, I have like a small courtyard garden and, you know, like a lot of the world I've been watching YouTube videos on how to plant tomatoes and doing a lot of uh, green finger stuff. And then also, um, I'm very lucky that I have my uh, TV development company on the side as well. So writers have, my writers have still been writing, develop, TV development has still been happening, albeit under a new color of what the future might look like. So um, I have been able to maintain the storytelling part of my brain as well in that way. That's amazing. And you've got kind of the, br the breathing room to, to really exactly. dive Exactly. Yeah. No excuse for not having read the new draft of whatever got sent to you. Yeah. No excuse. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wonder, are you watching anything now that you, have you started any new shows? I mean, you sound like you're more on the creative side of, of the end of the spectrum, but out of curiosity, I always love to hear what actors are, are sort of dipping their fingers in. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've been, I've, I started watching, um, I've been starting to watch a few new shows. I've been watching, uh, I've been so out of touch with British, the British landscape. So to be honest with you, I've been primarily watching British shows. Um, I don't know if they've come out at the same time in the States, but um, under the Fremantle family, who um, my production company is with, um, is also a show called The Luminaries. And um, they had a show called, they have a second season of a show called My Brilliant Friend, which I think you guys get as well. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I've, tried being, I've been trying to catch up with the British TV landscape, to be honest with you, because I was stateside for so long. Right, amazing. So I want to dive into your incredible performance on Penny Dreadful. I, I, it's so, it must be so fun to play someone like Magda. And, and just for the people who don't have the context of the show, can you, can you tell us, talk a little bit about your character and then also give us some background on the show itself? So people who know um, uh, the house style of Penny Dreadful from the original three seasons um, show will know that it's um, supernatural period meets, um, yeah, meets drama. And uh, that is what John Logan has taken over from that incredible ensemble cast to this um, wonderful ensemble cast. It's sort of an interweaving of um, a broad range of characters dealing with some specific themes, which I'm sure we'll get to, um, with this genre supernatural um, horror element to it. So um, Penny Dreadful City of Angels is set in 1938, but unfortunately also very much about our current world. And um, yeah, we primarily follow um, an American Mexican family, the Vega family. And then um, we sort of peel off into lots of interweaving stories from there, which is kind of John Logan's calling card with um, the Penny Dreadful anthology as he's thinking of it. Amazing. And of course you play a, a, a wide array of characters. <laughs> oh yes, sorry, you asked me about Magda. So Magda is, um, she, I can never say this without smiling. She is a shape-shifting demon. Um, uh, so she, um, she's presented as the sister of um, the Catholic folklore, Mexican folklore um, icon, Santa Muerte. Um, and um, the sisters have obviously had an argument and they're arguing, there's some pain and anger between them and they're arguing over their attitudes towards mankind. And Magda's attitude is very much mankind is innately bad, it is innately evil. So, you know, that's a philosophical question that goes back to the beginning of time. Um, are we innately good or bad? And what does it take to push us in a certain direction? 
And so almost um, like being goaded by her sister, Magda goes off to prove that mankind, her, you know, as far as she's concerned, the jury is, you know, definitely come back in and um, it's not good for mankind. And so you then see her manifest herself as different uh, people with um, a great um, selection of cast who will have fantastic storylines of their own. In to what great ends? Well, the, the genius of John Logan will show us in, uh, ultimately. So, um, but there's a lot going on. There's a lot on a themic and philosophical level, as well as a great sort of, I suppose at its core, a cop who done it. So there's just a pure entertainment level as well, but the genre hopefully heightens it uh, as a catalyst in its themes. For sure. I, you, you touched on the, the, the sort of philosophical aspects of it, because I feel like Magda really lays out how she feels about humanity from the outset. She says, mankind need, what did she say? All mankind needs to be is the monster he truly is to be told. He's that being he can. told he can. Yeah. I mean, how pertinent is that for, for our modern world? It's, I mean, when, when, when John Logan came to me uh, at the beginning of last year, I mean, obviously there was all sorts of things happening in the world from, Brexit, my side of the pond, and Europe becoming increasingly polarized politically, and you guys have had your own things going on, and you don't need to elaborate there. And so I was just sort of taken by this idea that he really wanted to, I think for all of us, I think, you know, everyone watching here will understand that we often pick jobs, we often pick stories, because we're cathartically trying to process something ourselves. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily know the answer to it, or it's disturbing us. And you know, sometimes um, we're made uncomfortable by a story or the idea of playing a role, and then you really look at and you think, why? Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, um, John's themes of wanting to explore why we're losing this middle ground politically over the last handful of years, why right can't seem to talk to left and this sort of neutral middle ground where we can have a half decent conversation without saying that we want to kill each other it is slowly dissipating the way it did in the interwar years just before the second world war you know demonization of other be it communities or race or um and also there's sort of this technology factor that i find interesting in the show i mean for us it's social media but for 1938 it's mass radio and sort of this propaganda via wireless as it was called um, so there were some, there were some themes there. I really empathized with John's idea that those warning signs of what was happening before, you know, we started a, a, a war against fascists, um, you know, uh, like why have we forgot, why have we forgotten that? And if that meant that I had to be the antagonist in that, in that situation, in that story, then I was game because, you know, it's something that I was been on my mind for the last handful of years, as I'm sure it has you guys. And then you add to that, oh, here's an opportunity to play four roles for the price of one. And then, then it kind of becomes a no brainer, you know? Well, I wanted to ask a little bit uh, how playing the antagonist in such a dark character, was it weightier than you thought it would be? Or was it, was it like pure fun? Because sometimes I, I watch you on screen and I'm like, she's having a blast. Like you look like you were, you were thoroughly enjoying everything that you're bringing to the, to the camera. And so what was that like for you on the performance side? Was it, was it a more emotionally trying than you anticipated or, or was it fun? That's a really pertinent question, Brianna, and thank you for asking me that. And actually, you're the first person that's asked me that in promoting this show for months. Um, I, I never took the role believing that I was playing the devil incarnate, a two-dimensional, um, a two-dimensional, um, you know, Lucifer or, or, or Satan, because, you know, two-dimensionality isn't interesting. That kind of binary Nate thing isn't interesting. And you know, to me, I had, the way she had been pitched at me, I always assumed um, it was sort of inferred that, you know, she, there is a human level to her and Santa Muerte's interaction, a capriciousness that makes them more like, I suppose how we would think of like a family of gods, maybe from like the Ro ancient Rome or ancient Greek or um, Norse mythology, like personalities, gods, demons that actually have recognizable sort of human personality traits and characteristics so from i came from the position of well you know magda hurts about something you know she's angry she's in pain and you know so and you know 
then obviously it's interesting if there's a chance of correction or redemption on that journey. And over the course of the season, when some of her, her iterations like Elsa, you know, starts doing like really quite dark shit, if I'm allowed to say that. It's, and you know, you're starting to get into very dark territory regards, you know, Nazi ideology and so forth. Yeah, it was, it's hard. It's, it's, it was more emotionally uh, taxing to play someone that was so angry and negative and intent on bringing out the worst in people than I had imagined. And I, you know, I think Rio is very, and I, I really tried to make Elsa, Rio and Alex three-dimensional fleshed out human beings. They have, you know, quite well written sort of backstories. There is some understanding of where they come from. And I, their pain, their hurt, what made them choose the way they chose, um, which sort of ties in with the idea of the theme of the show that good people do bad things. I liked to imagine that those three iterations that Magda had created were based on real people, that, that they actually, that she, her power was limited, that she had to grab um, um, inspiration from something that had actually happened to genuine humans, because then that provides sort of an interesting exploration of what pain or anger or repression or threatening of your family or community makes people do stuff. Because someone like Rio, you know, one person's freedom fighter is another person's terrorist. And, you know, Alex, we come to find, has got an interesting background story as well. Um, so it's a really waffly long answer for you. But um, the, tr the truth is, yes, I realized that um, I wasn't playing Magda and she just dressed up in four costumes. I ended up realizing I was playing four quite sad or angry or wounded human beings. And you know, everyone watching will know like that there's a residue and a, and a muscle memory that comes from that. So I had to learn to shake it off, mm. do a bit of a uh, mental and physical yoga to get rid of that. Yeah. And you like to run as well. So I'm assuming that probably was. <laughs> yeah, it helps. It, 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 it gets it, it gets it out of the system, yeah. but I have to say it was a joyous shoot in so far as I mean you can see from the ensemble cast that we did also have a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to be around the likes of um, Nathan Lane or Michael Gladys, who I, we had a lot of fun when I was playing Alex or Michael Gladys. I laughed a lot. He's a he's a good crack, um, and so and and the ensemble cast and the joy and the enthusiasm and the talent of the ensemble cast of the actors I got to work with um, really um, was a plus on this job. Mm, amazing. I want to dive in a little bit into the sort of very distinct characters that you touched on a little bit, the very distinct characters that you've built with Elsa and Rio and Alex. And you know, the costuming is such a huge part of that, but then there's accent work and then there's like posturing that I think that you bring into each character that's very, very clear what, what you're doing. It's very, you know, they feel very separate despite them all being you. Um, but what did that prep process look like for you knowing that you were gonna be playing four different people? And then Magda, of course, bring her into the, into the mix. Did your prep process look any different knowing that you were gonna be splitting your attention in that way between these four women? It absolutely did. It required me, due to the sheer amount of um, work, it forced me to follow my gut more and make decisions quicker than maybe I ordinarily would with a characterization. And there was a lot more of sort of from the outside in um, with this job than I would normally experience with the job, um, which is sort of, you know, sort of like, very old sort of classical theater training concept, really. It's sort of, it's a very like Laurence Olivier kind of attitude of start from the, the physicality and, and it build it inwards. Whereas we're so much more used in the 21st century of very much believing in whether you call it Stanislavski or method or from like, like from inside out. But um, I had to draw lines of definition quite quickly and um, you know, John Logan was very clear what he, what he, when he knew he didn't want something, he was very quick at, you know, giving me the, the cul-de-sac. So I moved on. But for all of them, they started with voice because I went over to audition in New York um, for John. And I, the, for the couple of days before, I was sending him 
voice messages, you know, just from my phone. Like, what about this for Alex? Like, tried a bit of Irish and no, close that down. <laughs> it's like, um, you know, is, is, this, is this Elsa? Is, is this just like the Elsa? Should it be more breathy? Should it be? So I kind of started with voice first. Um, and then when I got to New York, he and I did an afternoon of sort of like workshopping them a bit. And then I had some time after I got the job, I had a couple of months. And when you find yourself then in pre-production, obviously costume affects the way you work. And um, I decided that I would, I would, it would really help me if maybe um, Alex had a, some kind of way that could change her mouth shape slightly because um, I wanted to change the two American characters as much as possible. So we put a little bumper in the front of my, that I wore in my mouth, lenses. I mean, the hair and makeup department really helped me get there. And whereas Magda, Supernatural Magda, that demon, as you say, the one that looks like she's having an awful lot of fun, um, that sort of like black, you know, demoness, like driving through the field. I think that, you know, that look was very much John Logan's image of what he wanted Magda to be. But the three iterations were, you know, when I, I had some nice little bit of input to them. And all I can tell you, babe, is when you put on a zoot suit, you automatically, your shoulders go back, man. It's just, <laughs> it's just, I, I, I highly encourage all, everyone right now, male or female, to invest if they can, any opportunity in wearing a zoot suit because it's just such a beautiful um, tutorial um, expression of confidence, ease, empowerment. They knew what they were doing, those pachucos. So sometimes the clothes, sometimes the clothes do it for you. But Alex, yeah, Alex was the one that I really wanted to, you know, find it, really get away from myself. Um, and I suppose my theatre training came in, is the truth of the matter. I sort of went back to very much my, uh, my stage training box of tricks for all that. Is there a, an aspect of your training that you found, theatre or otherwise, that you found was most useful uh, on this project? I think exactly what we're saying is just basically range because you've got to find a way, you know, to, and if I took a job, I, you know, I'm not one of those actors that finds accents easy. I really don't. It, it, it can take me quite a while. I really have to put, I don't have a natural musical ear in that way. Unfortunately, I really wish I did. Um, so, you know, ordinarily if I took a job, I would stay in an accent when the camera wasn't rolling. You know, when I do American gigs normally, I stay in an American accent the whole shoot, interact with cast and crew that way. Absolutely no chance of doing that on this. Like, <laughs> so um, from going from German, you know, to, to slightly different ranges within um, American and my British accent as well. So um, compartmentalizing and keeping lines clean. clean. And yeah, I, like it's acting, it's acting as craft, really, is what it is. It's, act, it's acting as craft, mm -hmm. um, which is a very interesting exercise to do when you've been, you know, you know, playing the game as long as I have. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, you've been in the game for a while, and, and it, that segues perfectly into my next questions, because you, like most actors, you've had your highs and your lows. You know, you booked your first major role almost eight, less than a year out of, out of school, right? You went to Weber Douglas and you booked your first role on Casanova and then you didn't work for a while mm -hmm. and you kind of had a lean period. And then of course you went on to book The Tudors and Hunger Games and then of course Game of Thrones. We can't go through this without mentioning <laughs> that. Um, but Go on, try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not really possible, yeah. <laughs> Um, but what advice would you impart to actors uh, who are who are looking for kind of guidance about the roller coaster, the roller coaster nature of this sort of career path? Yeah, I mean it's a marathon, not a sprint, which is a cliche, but it's true. And um, I think we all have an idea of of what we hope you know, it's really going to be like once we're out of the traps, but it, it, it never, it never shapes and forms itself that way. So it's about keeping yourself 
mind and heart as open as possible because you know you get burnt on the way as well you get really close to roles that then explode and make another actor or you do a job that you're utterly in love with and you gave your absolute soul to and you know something just went wrong in the edit and it just did not work and it, it, I think you learned to not take the highs too seriously or the lows too seriously you try to I mean, I try, I say, I stress the word try because we're all human, right? And we're all very emotional creatures, actors. We, we simmer at that higher level. We sort of, we, you know, we just, everything, we feel everything that little bit more. And I would just say, you know, you've got to try and make it about the journey, make it about the work. Um, and that in itself, and, you know, the people that you interact with, I mean, that's one of the things I've also learn after 15, 16 years in the job is you will interact with someone, maybe you don't quite get a job or something doesn't work out, you guys lose your financing, but you'll come across that person four or five years later, or you'll be asked for, or you'll be able to do something for them. And so um, those people that you've been touched by or you've been inspired by, it's beautiful how they do come round. You know, so Francis Lawrence, for instance, who's the director of the Hunger Games, Mocking, uh, the Mockingjay movies. Um, I had done a pilot audition for him like six years previous. Studio test, screen test, like I'd been through the mill, like three days of, you know, all that. Um, when pilot season was a very different creature to what it has become now. And, um, you know, Francis wanted me and the studio didn't. And so lo and behold, for, you know, however many years later, it was like, Nat, I could, you know, I think we, I think we can work together. So it, it's, it's things like that. I would just say perseverance, perseverance and, and find joy along the way, you know? Mm -hmm. And I also feel like with that, in terms of finding joy, there's always a, a fine line between, as an actor, you know, really trying to choose characters who speak to you in a specific way. And then other times you're just like, I need a, I need a part. I need to get, yeah. I need to sometimes get Sometimes you need to pay the mortgage. Yeah. yeah, 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 completely. And I think that's something that sometimes like the Joe public, they, they forget about that. They go, well, what, what attracted you to this role? And you're like, well, you know, it's like, yeah. My credit card was getting really large. <laughs> but you know, that's like, that's kind of like in-house knowledge that like, you know, the consuming public don't ever think about. <laughs> right. They're like, well, she must have had her, pair, her pick, her favorite one. She just yeah, made it. Yeah. She chose yeah. it. But there is a through line, I will say, with, with some of the characters that you've played. A lot of them are very centered around power. Either they are, you know, struggling to kind of rest it away from other people or they're around, you know, these very powerful sort of dynamics all the time. And so, of course, that's what makes inherently good storytelling a sort of power yeah. dynamics. But St yeah, status is one of the key touchstones of, of great storytelling. Yeah. Sure. But for you as an actor, you, you know, what specifically makes you excited about that sort of dynamic? Because, again, it is a, I find it is a through line. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, if you, if you feel that that's... Yeah, I mean, you're not the first person that's ever said that to me. And I have to say to you that... Um, that's kind of like a sub I think it's been a subconscious thing mm -hmm. um I think it's more to do innately it's what I was saying to you earlier about um we choose things maybe unwittingly because we're cathartically trying to process something ourselves mm -hmm. and I mean not like something like Game of Thrones like let's be completely honest you know I auditioned second season the first season had been absolutely you know huge and, you know, I went and auditioned to play Melisandre and when they said, and I didn't get it. And when they said, we'd like you to, you know, audition for Marjorie, I was like, who's this Marjorie chick? And like, you know, I would have played anything to be in that show at that point. I just, it made such an impact on me on the first one. It was like, I was like, Dan and David, I was like, you know, you know, tell me, <laughs> tell me what I'm doing. I'll play a dragon. <laughs> um, but, um, but yeah, on other times, especially on you know, less well-known gigs that I've taken as well. I think you're right. I'm, n I'm not interested, sorry, that's a bit too harsh. Um, I, try, I try not to play binary too often. I think all of us as humans are contradictory. 
I think that's what makes us human is that you are a character and then you act out a character. And I think we we all fundamentally walk this line of desire, fear, desire, fear. And, you know, people will say to me, you know, you like to play strong women. And I, I mean, I, I've said it before. It's like, I play terrified women because we're all terrified. Life is terrifying. It's how you handle that fear mm-hmm. and how they, how, how, how they try and, and get through that, that I find fascinating. Mm-hmm. So it's about finding human friction within characters. Like, I don't think, to go back to Marjorie Terrell, like, I don't think she was down with everything she was doing. You know, it's like, I don't think she, I, there was that, that was the only, I don't think she was 100% sure of herself all of the time. I think Marjorie Terrell, because she was an intelligent woman, questioned herself every step of the way. I went, what the hell am I doing? But that's for me, as you guys know, as an actor, is my internal process. And sometimes the audience see it all and sometimes they don't. That's what I mean about it also being for you. It also has to be, yeah, it's for them, but it's also for you as well. I think that's the push-pull of being an artist. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a parallel, ro- it, you know, it's a rail track like that, two lines. Amazing. Are there any of your performances that you find have stuck with you or, or, or not, not, not only because, you know, people constantly ask you about Marjorie Terrell, I'm sure when you do, when you do interviews, but on, on that personal level, on the, on the, on the way that you, that you just said, you kind of do it for yourself. Are there any characters who you find have lingered longer than you thought they would? Uh, Anne Boleyn lingered for a long time. And I don't think it was just because she was my first job. I think it was because I read so much about the real woman. And I think sometimes when you play a real human being, you feel a real you know, weight of responsibility, especially when they've been misinterpreted as Anne Boleyn had and vilified in death, you know, and that she was <clears throat> a pure uh, sort of re- religious revolutionary, that she really did believe in the Protestant revolution. Um, which I think often doesn't get told when in the many, many great actresses have played Anne Boleyn and continue to. And, and they will because she is so textured and rich, um, which is really quite extraordinary when Henry VIII did everything he could to stamp out her from history after her death. But um, after reading so many books about her, um, she st- I, I found her a courageous woman. Um, you know, in an era of, of, of men where, you know, women have no currency other than who their father is or who they're married to. She stayed with me. Um, and I think, you know, often stage performances that I've chosen have stayed with me um, because I think there's a, a different level not always, but often because of the length of time you spend rehearsing and because of the length of time you spend place. Play, spend playing a role, um, a character can leave more of a residue on you. So, like I played Miss Julie in Patrick Marber's After Miss Julie, um, which is a reimagining of the original play. And um, that was a very special experience as well. But I mean, you know, they're all good. I mean, I had a lot of fun running around, obviously, in the Hunger Games as well. And I found that a fascinating job because. Cressida is fundamentally a watcher. She's a director. She's a, she's a, that's a, that was an interesting role and a thematic role for her because she's a documentary. That, there was a whole argument there about propaganda and about whether she, whether she was part of the system that was using Katniss, even though it was for a, a, a higher good. So, um, I mean, everything, everything teaches you a little bit about life. And I think you're... I think if you're a good actor, your, 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 your opinions and your values change as you get old, you get affected by work. You start to think about things a little bit differently and you realize that, you know, um, or certainly I have, the world is, le- you realize that the world is less simple, not more simple as you get older, I think. It's lovely. You've played some awesome women. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I really, I mean, I really have. And I, and I hope to play some, or more, you know, <laughs> just, um, it's, uh, it's a very interesting time in our mm. industry. 
it's a very interesting time in our industry. So, I mean, we are really waving the, the, the flag now for equality um, in all its guises okay. and in front and behind the camera. It's ridiculously overdue. So um, I feel privileged to be, you know, witnessing this time in our industry. It's, um, it's going to be really, it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, that resonates with me as well. I feel so privileged to be alive right now to, to witness this, to see everything how in terms of our industry, but also in our world. Um, yeah, it's it's incredible. It's an interesting um, time to be alive. That's definitely true. Absolutely. Um, so I have one more question. It's a biggie. <laughs> okay. Um, but what performance should every actor see and why? Oh, wow. That is a biggie. That's I huge. Did. I warned you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow. Oh, God. That's absolutely, that's a huge question. All I would say, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick myself when I hang up from you now and say, I should have said, mm. you know, I think, <sighs> it's really hard. It's really hard. I think, I think, I think actress, I think speaking as an actress, cause that's my gender. Mm -hmm. It's like, I do think that we should make more of a habit of going back to, you know, the thirties and the forties and see the women that were trailblazing before us, because we like to think that we invented the wheel sometimes. And I think when you watch some of those older performance, those older performances, um, you know, uh, I think it, it makes you, realize what a rich heritage we have in our short cinema history. So I would always encourage people to go back and watch, you know, Betty Davis, Lauren Bacall, Vivian Lee, Catherine Hepburn. I think absolutely we forget. Um, and that can be really inspiring and invigorating. I think people should read more. I think you should read. I think you should go back to check off. I think you people should go back to Tolstoy. It's like, there are some really great, there are some really great stories um, that, yeah, get regurgitated uh, in television, but it's not quite the same. And so when it, when it learn, when you learn about characterization, um, I think, I think literature, all forms of storytelling as well can really help. Awesome. Thank you so much, Natalie. I'm so thrilled that we got to chat and I hope you stay well and stay safe and your family, you know, keeps well in this crazy time. Yeah. You guys too. Thank trying you. times. So stay safe. Yeah. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>